Welcome to Allergic Living's Allergy Clinic, a video series in which we talk to leading experts about topics of vital importance to those managing food allergies. I'm Gwen Smith, Allergic Living's editor and content chief, and your host for this video series. We're most fortunate today to be joined by Dr. Rushi Gupta, an expert who's known for her extensive demographic research on food allergies. She's released a new book called Food Without Fear, and we're going to hear her thoughts on the state of food allergy, from the frequent confusion over the condition to anxieties, and why she's hopeful that the millions living with this disease can lead richer lives than they may have today. So welcome, Dr. Gupta. Thank you so much, Gwen, for having me. You're well known to the community, but I'll just remind people that you're a professor of pediatrics and medicine at Northwestern University School of Medicine and a physician at Lurie Children's in Chicago. In terms of research, you were the founding director of the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research, CIFAR for short, also at Northwestern. So I can't wait, let's, let's dive in. Um, I'd like to start with your studies on food allergy prevalence. They have brought us so much rich information. 32 million Americans have food allergies, one in 13 kids, and, and now we learn one in 10 adults. Can you comment on the magnitude of food allergy as a disease? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, we were, quite surprised by that brand new study in adults, which really prompted this book. But the magnitude is, is quite large, one in 13 kids in the US. And we've seen this, we've seen this ourselves in a generation, you know, how, how much of an increase we've seen in food allergies in kids, we thought. And I know we both, you know, have our own personal stories. You know, my daughter lives with food allergies. So not only, you know, do I see patients with it and research it, but I live it every day. And that's why, you know, it's become almost a mission to better understand it. So the idea of the prevalence was really interesting because as we kept focusing on kids, um, people started asking me about adults and what's going on in the adult population. And so we uh, did our survey in a general adult population of 40,000 adults in the United States. And what was so fascinating about that, Gwen, was that one in five adults said to us that they thought they had a food allergy. So one in five, so you're, we're talking 20%. And then when we looked at the symptoms and we, we tried to break it down into, is this truly a food allergy or is it some other food related condition? we came to about one in 10, as you said, having a food allergy. But then the other number that often doesn't get talked about is that only 5% of those adults said they had a diagnosis, a physician diagnosis. So only one in 20 are getting diagnosed. So I think- So it's a lot of people, I guess, assuming they have a food allergy? Yeah, and I, I totally understand it because if you eat a food as an adult, you know, first of all, and I'm guilty of it too, we don't, take care of ourselves as much as we take care of our kids and we've got busy lives. And so a lot of times, you know, what I hear is that I ate this and I had this reaction. And so I stopped eating the food. And the most common term that we use for that, you know, eating a food, having a reaction is food allergy. You know, although there are multiple things that can cause a bad reaction to a food and then you avoid it in your diet and, you know, obviously half of those individuals are not going to get a, a formal diagnosis. So a big part of this is just trying to help people understand, you know, what's happening to them when they eat a food and have a negative reaction. Let's back up to those 2019 study findings. What was really interesting in the media headlines was the focus on how many people just thought they had food allergies, but really didn't. But actually you're finding that 10.8% of Americans have food allergies as adults is quite stunning. It, it's about double what a few earlier studies had found, is it not? Very much, yes, absolutely. And you're right. And that 
that's for us, that was frustrating because it is a large number that have a convincing food allergy. And what was even more striking about that, and I'm glad some of the media did focus on this, is how many adults said that they developed a food allergy as an adult. You know, we, we had heard this a lot and, and allergists and, and physicians are starting to see it more, but to document it, you know, that there is a, a large group of adults who are developing new allergies as an adult. Well, I'm one of them. I have adult onset food allergies to shellfish and then later to peanut and soy. But again, on the media coverage, some reporters even accused people of faking food allergies. You mentioned this study as an impetus for your book. Was your idea to write it related to the food allergy confusion? Exactly. Yes, it was. Um, nobody wants to fake a food allergy, right? Like why? What, what, what do you get out of it? And all the adults who eat a food and have to avoid it, we know, you know, I know how hard it is to avoid foods in your diet. So no one would want to do it. You know, you eat all the time and to have to make sure it is free from certain foods is so challenging for individuals. So um, one of the big impetus was just that if there's that many people out there avoiding a food, how do we help them figure out what it is that's going on in their bodies and then how to manage it and treat it better. And so this is kind of a, a beginning. And then we would encourage all of them once they have a better understanding, then to talk to their physician and their allergist about, about steps to take. And this is what I think I have. And these are my symptoms. And so that's why we have that that stop, right? S-T-O-P, to really understand your symptoms and the signs and you know, what instigated your reaction and then understand, you know, what treatments helped, what, you know, what to do, and then understand what your options are. And then finally, you know, have a plan forward. And that's a very simplified way of saying it, but just to really think of it in chunks, you know, what, it, what's going on, what food, and then, you know, how, how did I feel better? What did I do? You know, and then when did it happen? And then really understand, um, what your options and testings and then go on. Now that's a really nice part of your book. You spell out things like your stop method. You have things like checklists if you're going to go to the allergist. But to back up, when it comes to that large group of people who didn't have the immune-based IgE mediated food allergies, people can be dismissive of them. But in the book, you're not. In fact, you're very sympathetic. You talk about those other diseases as masqueraders. Can you give us an idea of what you mean by that term and those diseases? Oh, sure. Yeah. And it, it really, it really bothers me to call those extra, you know, 5%, you know, fake or, you know, they don't have a food allergy and it's not important because anytime you eat a food and have a negative reaction, we all know, you know, even with food poisoning, how miserable you can be, right? So it is all of them, all the conditions are important. Food allergies have gotten a lot of attention, but every single potential condition is important. And it's important to know what you're having, whether it's an intolerance, um, whether it's oral allergy syndrome, you know, what to, to define it, to know it, and then be empowered to manage it and treat it. So yes, so we, we have a, a spectrum in this book and that spectrum walks you through. And it's really hard, as you know, you've been in this space for, for so long too and, and have experienced so much of this um, yourself, but that spectrum of disease, how do, you, how do you develop different categories for different food conditions? And we did attempt to do that in this book. And so we go from allergic, like you said, immune mediated conditions to um, kind of a mixed condition, immune and non-immune to non-immune mediated conditions and then to GI conditions, you know? So, so in all of this, just, you know, for people to know is available um, even without the book on our website, it's foodwithoutfearbook.com. Uh, and if you go to it and you go to resources, you will be able to see that spectrum and it's interactive. So you can actually um, click on different terms and better understand what those conditions are. So with that spectrum, you're talking about everything from celiac disease to FPIs, oral food allergy syndrome, EOE. So you're really trying to help people distinguish among them. Exactly. So, you know, under the allergy category, food allergy is the biggest one. 
you know, OAS actually sits there, alpha gal, and then food dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis. And then you know, we characterize mixed reactions, which also include things like EOE, right? Eosinophilic esophagitis, which we're seeing an increase in. And then eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, um, FPIs, which I, I know you've written about or, or talked about too, because it is another one that we're really discovering, food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. Then, you know, we call them the masqueraders, but they are all in their own right, uh, important condition. And these include um, what people refer to as sensitivities or in the medical community, we refer to as intolerances, right? So intolerances, sensitivities, chemical sensitivities, you know, food additives, carbs, all of those, those pieces, allergic contact derm, you know, gustatory rhinitis. Those are, those are some things we call masqueraders because oftentimes people have pretty strong symptoms. They'll have major GI distress and bloating and diarrhea. And it's not, it's not a comfortable thing, right? But it, how, do you, how do you distinguish that from something like a food allergy? And then there's other masqueraders um, like the GI disorders I talked about, IBS, um, IBD, uh, which are very, very important to make sure that you know if that is what you have because the treatment is very different. You mentioned celiac disease and studies show it can take many years to get a diagnosis. And, and that's really quite problematic because you can be having serious symptoms all the time and you just don't know what's wrong. Um, the same is true with adult onset food allergy. It's hard to figure out we don't eat uh, simply like we do when we're a baby, when somebody is sort of, you know, shoveling one food at a time your way, you're eating, you know, a complex dinner out at a restaurant with many foods and flavors or a packaged food that may have additives and, and various things. So for instance, with soy allergy, that one wasn't obvious for me. It took a long time uh, to figure out. Uh, and then it was figured out because there was anaphylaxis. In, in looking at your book, I think it might also be helpful for the doubters we encounter with food allergies, you know, the, the in-law who doesn't quite get the severity or doesn't just can't seem to grasp cross context. So I, I think there's really a, a lot of value in that as well. Yeah, I, I hope so. I, you know, I think because food conditions have risen so quickly, like you said, an in-law or a grandparent, you know, a lot of times you hear the same phrases, well, this wasn't around when I was young, you know, what's going on? Are we being too, you know, you, too helicoptery and, and this isn't really that big of a deal. And so we really want to explain the science and, and what is happening in your body and, and what it can do. And we all, I mean, we all know how serious food allergies can be. You know, they can be life-threatening, you can go into anaphylaxis and it is something that you have to be prepared for and educated and know how to manage. And so trying to make sure people understand that versus some of these other conditions also need to be managed, right? So understanding what it is you have and how to manage it and then potentially how to treat it. And like you, you know, like kids grow out of allergies. That is not uncommon. So going regularly to see, because when you're avoiding a food, you don't know, maybe you, develop tolerance to it. So getting to an allergist to make sure you still have it so that if, if it's not one of these conditions or if you have developed tolerance, you can add it back into your diet and enjoy more, more foods. You know? How great would it be if you could eat soy again <laughs> someday? While having you here, I thought this was also a, a good opportunity to uh, both out of your book and uh, out of the uh, your own uh, previous research, I thought I would try to throw you uh, three uh, fast uh, fact or fiction questions. Ooh. So here's one for you uh, that we hear repeatedly said, um, food allergies are just an upscale white person's disease. Oh, no. <laughs> fiction. <laughs> yeah, that is not true. Um, yes. And, you know, to be honest with you, Gwen, when I got into food allergies 17 years ago, I was really came into research to study asthma disparities. So I was doing that. I continued to. Um, but what really shocked me was that food allergy was part of the atopic spectrum, right? Eczema, allergies, asthma, and they run together. So you have a higher chance of having 
one if you have the other. And many people have all of them. But um, but what was shocking to me was asthma. We knew there were so many disparities that existed, and we knew it was higher in in you know black children, and we also knew it was significant in low SES children. But for food allergies, it was people were talking about it being the opposite. And so a lot of the research we did and a lot of the work we do is to really understand differences in food allergy by race and SES. And what we found is it is the same, right? It is higher actually in black children, about the same in Latinx children. However, what we have also found with SES is that a lot of kids with food allergies don't get diagnosed properly because it's not like asthma where you have to have your inhaler, right? You just, you need it. Um, for food allergy, there hasn't been a treatment until, you know, just recently for food allergies. And even the one treatment we have is just for peanut allergy right now. So a lot of these kids never got to an allergist, never got a full complete diagnosis. And therefore we just didn't think they had it, which is not the case. So Long it could have been a right. lot to do with access. Okay, okay I'm going to make you zing though on these. Okay, I'll zing, I'll zing. We'll, we'll go the okay. faster. So uh, <laughs> the other one, oh, we hear this a lot. Mom guilt. I'm to blame. I ate the wrong things I introduced. And now with, of course, knowing that we're supposed to introduce uh, an allergen like peanut or egg to children early, they say, I introduced peanut butter too late. What do you say to the mom who's sitting there feeling guilty? Oh my goodness. This is one of my biggest, biggest, um, I guess, peeves is that moms, we, we all feel guilty. All right. I don't know, Gwen, if you remember, the New York Times actually published an article when Peanut, the, um, you know, Gideon Lack and, and the LEAP trial came out. And in it, it was me commenting, but then it was Dr. Gupta is slapping herself on the wrist because she did not introduce Peanut to her own daughter early. <laughs> So my mom guilt is published out there. But I, <laughs> and you republished it in the book, I noted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I want all moms to know, like we didn't yeah. know these things. And I also have a comic in another book where it's a mom saying, you know, I ate peanuts early. That's why my kid has peanut allergies. And the other mom saying, I didn't eat peanuts while I was pregnant. That's why my child has peanut allergies. So basically there should be no guilt um, motto to live by is we're all doing the best that we can, right? And we are with what we know and what we have. And one of my favorite quotes is Maya Angela, which is also in the book, which is just exactly about that. You know, do the best you can until you know better Then when you know better, do better. And so we are learning more every day. Moms should not be guilty about anything they're doing because you're doing what you know right now to be the best for your child. Absolutely. Here, here for that. Yeah. <laughs> Take that away. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and just very quickly, uh, you, you cover quite a bit on the Western diet um, in, in the book of diet period. Um, how much of an influence do we think now that uh, the Western uh, diet has on the development of food allergies or even just the progress of it? Yeah, that's really important. Um, the Western diet, yeah, I, I'm i a big advocate for, for doing things as natural as you can. And I do think we've medicalized a lot, right? And it it's understandable why, but we need to get back, like it's the pendulum and it's been swinging and we got to get back to some kind of middle ground, right? Because we, you know, we talk about the diet, we talk about how we introduce foods to infants one at a time, wait three to five days, they're not getting the diversity, you know, wait till six months. Um, so they're not getting a lot of foods in their diet be before that magical, you know, first year of life while their immune system's developing. So, you know, that's very different than it used to be where, you know, you eat babies, eat what parents eat, just chewed up probably in the mom's mouth with some microbiome and then given to the, the kid. Yeah. You know? So we have gone to a more sterile route to a single food route and, um, it's okay, but we can do things to speed it up, right? Allergies don't typically happen, take five days to appear. Um, so start, you know, introducing foods every, every one to two days to your infant, you know, and when they're hungry, when they're ready to eat, get them into them and, and build it up. And, and those flavors that you talk about combining foods and, and introducing it. Um, 
other things in the Western diet, you know, it's just interesting. There's so many reasons as to why, why we're seeing this in, increase in the Western world. Um, and we could talk about that for a whole nother half hour, but you told me to do Zinger, so. <laughs> that. Yes, I did. Um, I, I must say that you've got so much in this book. We could go on all day. Um, you have an incredibly uh, uh, helpful index, for instance, on introducing potential allergenic solids to infants. Uh, I think the book is worth buying just, just for that. Um, now, one thing I am really curious about is the title, um, Food Without Fear. That's not an obvious concept to those managing food allergies, why that title and what did you mean by it? Well, you know, for those of us with food allergies and those of us taking care of people with food allergies, I think we know fear is a big part of everyday life because you fear accidentally eating that food. But, you know, one of our biggest goals is to empower individuals because if you have the knowledge and you know what you're doing and know how to manage it, you know, you can live a very healthy, content life without having fear be a part of all of it. And one, I wanted to take the fear out by, by empowering people with that knowledge and giving them the tools they need to successfully live every day. And I don't want fear, you know, fear cripples all of us in so many ways, you know, so that is, that is one big piece that I was hoping after reading it and after getting those pieces and better understanding instead of feeling fearing fearful, you know, feel a little bit empowered to know how to manage and live healthy, happy, everyday lives. You raise in the book that we're finally starting to see food allergy treatment options. In your studies, I'm curious to know, how open are food allergy parents to taking part in clinical trials for therapies? That's a really great question. Um, what we have found is that most parents, and this is another study we did previously, most parents do want their child to get treatment and to be in a clinical trial. Um, I think some of the fears around clinical trials is, is the you know double-blind placebo-controlled food challenge in the beginning um, because their kid is allergic and then they have to have a reaction in order to start the trial. Um, other fears of OIT trials specifically are just reactions throughout and knowing that they'll happen. But we find parents very interested. I think um, the burdensome pieces are the time that they have to give up, you know, to be there and some of those um, requirements. But studies are starting without those requirements now. And we do have, you know, a FDA approved treatment now for peanut allergy, which is awesome. And What's so exciting about the field are there's so many treatments in the pipeline, um, so many biologics, so many vaccines, so many, you know, so many, the patch, you know, there's so many things coming in the next. Sublingual so drops, there's all sorts yeah. of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and but what about when you look at the, the future of treatments, what are you most hopeful about? Wow, well, yeah, like I said, I've been doing this for 17 years and I couldn't be more hopeful uh, today because it started out a little slow and I feel like it's just revved up and sped up. And the space of food allergies, so many incredible researchers coming into it, um, so many industry uh, partners wanting to develop uh, prevention and treatments. And so, you know, when I look ahead to the next 10 years, I hope to be out of a job because we have plenty of treatments and people have choices and we have predictive models for what treatments could work for what individual. And we have prevention. So we're stopping it right at the beginning, you know, with early introduction and, and other things, vaccines potentially that are coming out. But one thing you write about, treatment won't be for everyone. We see this a lot with OIT, oral immunotherapy. Some people will sail through it. Some will have trouble sticking to the protocol. And then there's someone like Susan Titelli in your book. Could you just explain a little bit of her story? Yeah, um, it is not easy for everyone. That is 100% true. And I don't, I don't know if anyone really sails through it, um, but some people have harder times than others. And, you know, Susan is this amazing young woman. Uh, she's in college now, and she and her mom have been just huge advocates for this because they were some of the first to go through the OIT trials. 
And Susan had a number of reactions, um, even during the trials where she had to administer epinephrine um, quite frequently and, and sometimes multiple, um, to the point where she even made videos of herself doing it because she got so comfortable doing it that she wanted other kids to see that it's not really that scary. So I, I just think um, what she did with all the reactions that she had going through it was so empowering because she became an advocate to say, okay, I'm having reactions, but I wanna go to college and be able to not be scared. And so I'm gonna put myself through this with the reactions and I'm actually now not scared of epinephrine anymore. And I know what my reactions are and what I need to do to manage them. Um, and, and she's very happy for it. And she's eating new foods and, and feeling more free. And I just, yeah, her story is, is a very beautiful one. And I'm fortunate that she lives in Chicago and I get to see her and she comes back. But, um, and she trains kids at our conference on how to use epinephrine. Yeah, she's, she, uh, but yes, not easy, but she stuck to it. And she, she was determined. Even the ones who have an easier time of, of food allergy treatment, I, I find the food allergy kids in these trials are so brave. Um, it's really interesting to me that how many of them will tell you that they're not just doing it for themselves, but they're doing it to further science and, and to help other food allergy kids uh, along the way. And it's not for everyone. So if kids are not, if they're doing well, avoiding the food and happy and healthy, not having it right now, that's also okay, right? So there is uh, every, and this is where, you know, as a researcher, it's all about predictive models, like who is going to do well on what? And, and we're learning more and more by, you know, understanding individuals' characteristics that will help them succeed or fail on one of these treatments. And like I said, I mean, there's others that are not quite like OIT. You mentioned sublingual, you know, we know there's the patch, we know there's biologics coming down, anti-IgEs, you know, there's so many things um, that we have to look forward to. So I think adults and kids will have more choices in the coming years. That's great. And, you know, you and your team do a phenomenal amount of research. I, I don't know when you sleep, but uh, there's so much yet to be uncovered about food allergies as a disease, even, even in the demographics that you do a lot of, even in, in understanding and knowing that. What's one of the riddles that, that you'd really like to be able to solve in this area? Wow. Oh, my goodness. I mean... I would, I don't know if I can pick one, but I'll give you a couple or I'll give you a try. So the one that we're working really hard on right now is prevention. Um, we have a couple NIH studies going, trying to really understand how we prevent food allergies. And um, like you said, um, racially and socioeconomically um, different individuals, right? Like, and is it one size fits all or is it not? And can we predict how to do this in, in different individuals? Um, another thing that I know impacts you, impacts me, impacts probably everyone listening, is how do you predict severity of disease? How do you predict severity of a reaction? You know, right now, I think hugely important. Yeah. One of the hardest things, you know, that I experience and I hear from families is anywhere you go, you know, with my child even, it's like, well, how severe is it? And nobody gives you a, it's moderately severe or very severe. But yet each parent has to make that decision every time they drop them off at anything, right? A camp, well, how severe is the allergy? Can they be around it? Can they, you know, like, can they eat things that, you know, may contain, right? All of those things. And so really getting any more information on how do we, how do we um, give people better information, you know, and, and make this into more of a spectrum of severity, like most diseases are, like we see in asthma and other things, um, would be incredibly useful for families and individuals with food allergies. So there's two. I'll stop. <laughs> okay, Dr. Gupta, your new book really covers so much ground. And I think it's phenomenally helpful since many of our followers will want to get the book. Once again, it's called Food Without Fear. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear your thoughts today. I wish you all the best with this book. And thank you for joining me on Allergic Living's Allergy Clinic series. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for all you do. I mean, for as long as I've been in the field, I think you've been in the field educating people and getting information out um, to, to families with food allergies and other food conditions. So 
Really appreciate everything you do. Really appreciate it. I have to say, you know, as you know, I'm a pediatrician, but I had so many amazing people help contribute to this book from a number of allergists to GI doctors to dermatologists. So I, I feel like it is really um, complete in, in the knowledge. It wasn't just me. It's never just me. But um, the other thing I, I just want to tell viewers is, you know, go to the website, you know, if you, if you can read the book, get the book, but otherwise the website has so many useful tools that you can utilize even, you know, not that I'm not discouraging getting the book, but I, I do want people to be able to get the information. So it's foodwithoutfearbook.com. Thanks again, Dr. Gupta.